Splatoon's world building has always been amazing, and a lot of that can be attributed to all the small little details included in these games. While they may be small and insignificant on their own, when added up they can practically make or break the immersion of the world. That's why today I wanted to go over 5 mostly small aesthetic details that could go a long way in making Splatoon 3's world feel more immersive and full to bring much needed extra life and personality. These could both be missed opportunities or just cool extra things. Before we begin, I just wanted to say that due to my recent suspension of monetization on this channel, I decided to start a Patreon, where the link will be found in my channel banner, the about section, and the description of this video. You can show me your support by becoming a member, which I would really appreciate since it really helps me give me motivation to continue making content, along with giving exclusive access to occasional polls regarding future video ideas. Of course though, there's absolutely no pressure to either. If you can't or simply don't want to, no problem. None of you owe me anything. With all that said, let's get on to the video now. Splatoon 3 for whatever reason has the least amount of ink color combinations in the entire series, with a grand total of 10 as opposed to the first two games 14. And even then, two of those combos are slight duplicates of existing ones, so there's arguably only 8 fully unique color combos. That's why I would love for more ink color combinations to be added in the future to further spice up the visuals. If I could add 4 new combos to bring the count up equal to the older games, I would choose 3 from the first game, light blue versus orange, pink versus yellow orange, pastel blue versus aqua, and from Splatoon 2, green versus blue. These are some of my favorite combos in the entire series. When Splatoon 3 released, I was very impressed by the color combos I saw, but it didn't take long before I realized it has the dullest set of combos in the entire series. This could change though, especially with Color Lock getting new colors in an earlier update, and the overall much lower number of combos in the base game, which could have been done purposely, you never know. The Inkopolis DLC, for what it is, is a cute little bonus nostalgia trip with a decent amount of effort put into it, though still missing a ton of potential. One thing that was seemingly universally disappointing was pressing those triggers, ready to see the Squid Sisters broadcast for the first time in six years, only to be greeted by deep cuts. Yeah, that was extremely disappointing. Now I get it would take an insane amount of effort to add all the dialogue and such, and they probably didn't want to take too much of the spotlight away from Deep Cut, so let's meet halfway. At the very, very least, when you enter the news in Inkopolis, what should happen is that you get greeted by the Squid Sisters who say their intro, have a small little unique conversation, then simply say something along the lines of, now it's time to hear the stage news from Deep Cut in Splatsville, where it'll then cut to them and continue the news regularly as normal. Wouldn't that be cool? Speaking of the news, this one really baffles me that's even an exclusion at all. In the second game, whenever a Splatfest happened, the developers went through all the extra effort of making Pearl Marina do the news on the stage right before doing the performance. It was super hype and flowed perfectly. Ooh. Even in the first game, at the very least, Calais Marie's studio had different lighting and music during Splatfest. So why is it that Deep Cut during the news have their default daytime lighting and colors? Like, I understand on the first day when they all have their own stages to make them do the news in the studio, but at least change the lighting? Heck, why can't they at least have their own respective team colors? It's just so jarring to see them with their default looks during the daytime and then just teleport to the stage at night with different colors. Maybe there's a chance to overhaul it considering it took 9 months to add stage specific dialogue to the news and it's probably just another thing that was just rushed. I don't know. Also off topic, but why are their colors so dull ugly during Splatfests? Like, this isn't an issue with the Squid Sisters, who look amazing in this game, so what's the deal? Maybe I don't want them to have those colors in the news, actually. <laughs> okay, now we're going to my two favorite ideas. First up... Music has and always will be a huge part of Splatoon, and with the inclusion of the jukebox in 3.0, everyone and their mother seems to want customizable music selections added, especially since like two-thirds of the amazing soundtracks are locked to the first two games. Sadly, however, this doesn't seem to be something what we'll ever get, with the devs going on record stating that they want to make sure no one is able to have some kind of audio advantage by hearing different songs. Okay, I, I kind of get it. I mean, they're more worried about the balancing of the soundtrack than the actual maps, but I get it. What's the next best thing then? Here's my idea. What if every once in a while, say three or four rotations, there's a quote unquote retro hour rotation, where all of Splatoon 3's music will be replaced by the OST of one of the previous games. For the first game's soundtrack, it'd be called Retro Hour, Squid Squad Era, and for the second game, Wet Floor Era, since those were the main turf or branded bands of each game. I think this would be a perfect way to incorporate the first two games' amazing OSTs without overbloating the song list and overshadowing the third game's soundtrack. 
Out of everything on this list, this is what would have happened the most, especially since it would incline more people to want to play during the rotations he's happened on. It kind of reminds me of back when the game first launched and there was no jukebox, where it was random if you actually heard Splatoon 1 music or Splatoon 2 music playing in the lobby. Okay, last but not least is my personal favorite idea. Okay, maybe not full daylight cycles, seeing as Splatfest obviously exists at night, so let me explain. Something not many people talk about, but definitely irritates me, is how Flounder Heights and Museum Delfoncino have radically different lighting and skyboxes in this game compared to the original versions. Flounder used to take place during his late afternoon golden hour, and Museum used to have his cloudy, overcast sky. But now just both have basic, bright, sunny day aesthetics. Instead of just wishing to revert them to the original lightings, this made me think. What if each rotation had its own daylight cycle? Picture this. For the first 30 minutes of a rotation, every map would look like it was early in the morning with a nice pink and yellow sky. From 30 minutes in to an hour and a half, they look like noon with the current sunny day look most maps already have. Then 30 minutes before the rotation ends, we'd get to enjoy the warm golden hour evening the original flounder had before the next rotation started. Most rotations would be sunny clear days, but every once in a while, just like in real life, there'd be a couple in a row of overcast cloudy weather, reminiscent of the original museum. I think this would be very, very cool. Both these details could allow the world and each rotation to feel very dynamic, capturing the feeling of being a kid playing outside and knowing as the sun goes down, the time you have to play is steadily ticking away until the next day. Well, those are my ideas for now. I wouldn't say any of these are particularly likely to happen, but not out of the realm of possibility. Thanks for watching! Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment down below what you want to be added to Splatoon 3 next. If I like your idea enough, who knows? Maybe I can make a future video. See you next time!